Okay. Well, 1102 here in Chicago. Good morning or good. I think everybody would be in morning. I don't know that we have anybody later than, than noon, but for our East Coast friends, it's now a good afternoon. But welcome everybody to our webinar today. This is Ask the Experts about Fall Planter Combinations. So I think we will have a lot of great information from our panelists as well as a lot of inspiration. Uh, we have some beautiful photography coming up uh, that we'll do in the last half. Uh, the one thing I did want to tell all of our attendees is that it's very helpful if you guys put your Zoom on speaker view, you can do that in the upper right corner. Um, that way, as each one of our panelists are speaking, you can look at their lovely faces. Um, we will have this PowerPoint up just for a little while while we're um, doing introductions. I'll take the PowerPoint down. And then about halfway through, about 30 minutes in, I think we'll finish up with a lot of our uh, pre asked questions, um, but we're happy to take additional questions. So you can just put those in, um, in the chat. Uh, yeah, let's use the chat function. We don't have a Q&A function on this. So if you have any questions that come up, put them in chat. If it's something I already have on my list and we're getting to, don't think I'm ignoring you. We will get to that. Um, and then about halfway through, we'll put our PowerPoint back up and we're going to have pictures uh, for inspiration. So there's different combinations that our members have provided. And then our panelists will talk a little bit about each one of those combinations. And then we'll wrap up and go back to any additional questions or comments from our panelists in the last few minutes. So um, now, oh, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Diane Blazik. I'm the executive director of National Garden Bureau and All America Selections. Um, incognito here is Gail Paps from my office. So she's kind of running things in the background and she does all of our social media and marketing. So you can thank her for finding out about this webinar if you found out about it through our social media or through our newsletters. And now our panelists, we have Claire Josephson from Pan American Seed, if you can wave, there you are, with the nice background, thank you for adding that in. And we have Katie Rotella, also from Pan American Seed and the Ball Companies. Hey, and then we have Janet Sluice from Sunset and Southern Living Plant Collections. And we have Georgia Clay from Monrovia. So we... Thank everybody. And I think um, we are ready to get started with some of our questions. And um, so I wanted to start real general um, because I think there's always good tips, especially from the experts, the people that are doing this all the time. Um, and just take turns. It's up to you guys. Who wants to go first, second, third, et cetera. Um, so let's talk about some overall tips for container gardens. And one of the ones this, and I'm sorry if I'm stealing any of your thunder, but for me, it's always use a big enough container. <laughs> Those little six or eight inch things. I'm sorry. That's, that's what you buy your plants in. If you want them at home, use a big enough container. So that's my one tip. I'll throw it over to you guys now. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to jump in first so that when you buy a plant uh, and it, it, it speaks to you at the garden center and you bring it home, um, whether you buy three or four smaller pots, you have to put them in something large. You have to take them out of that pot and put them in something larger. Otherwise, I mean, the biggest thing is going to be maintenance because those pat those little pots are going to dry out so fast. And we're in the season now in most of the country, and especially down south, you're still possibly reaching high 80s, high maybe in the 90s. So, but you'll see the, the morning frost, the morning dew will be really cold. So that kind of fluctuate in temperature, you could get a lot of different kinds of weather thrown at you. So those little pots are really going to stress a plant out at this time of year. So getting them in a nice forever home that allows you to really have a place to play. I think that's probably the, the best opportunity. And uh, there's so many beautiful containers that you can get really funky in the fall with, uh, with container styles that you pull out only for this time of year. Um, that's always the best time is when you put away your summer containers and you pull out something new for fall. Yeah, and, and along those themes, I'm gonna go into the soil. I have a soil science background. So at, when you're in a pot, it's so much more important to have a really good soil. I mean, that's not the place to skimp. 
on your plants. You're actually better off spending more money on your soil than your plants, if you believe it or not, because the, if you have bad soil, you're never going to be successful in your containers. So make sure you have a really good soil mix, really good drainage, but also that can hold on to the water. So you, you know, buy a good potting soil for that. And back in the old days, which I'll probably remember, they used to tell us to put a layer of gravel or something else in the bottom of the pot to increase drainage. And what we've actually found is that deep, it just forms a barrier. Eventually all the little particles will go into that gravel and make it not drain. So it's counterproductive to do that. And it actually hurts your plants. So you're better off not putting anything in the bottom of your pot, maybe just a little screening from your, from your screens or something to keep the soil from coming out. But you don't want to have that layer of anything down at the bottom because it just creates problems down the road. And just to add, it's, you know, getting a bigger pot using really nice soil, just be sure that your container has drainage holes. <laughs> That's a really big deal too. There's a lot of cute vintage containers that can be found um, sort of unexpected. And if it doesn't have a hole, just drill one. Um, it'll make a great container. Just be sure that you get those holes in there. Right. Because again, this time of year, you're going to want to choose a little bit something different um, or something that matches the season. And if you find something cool, but it doesn't have that hole, uh, an afternoon rain or an unexpected shower could really drown young roots. Cause again, you're buying, if you're buying fresh plants, they're going to go through a shock a bit of transplanting to their new containers. So those roots are going to need a place to soak up water, but you don't want to saturate for sure. So Janet, I want to ask you um, tips for the viewers here in terms of switching soil from summer to fall. Is that necessary or is it worth saving it to economize? What's your, what's your tip on that? You know, I'm the lazy gardener, so I really use my soil longer than recommended. I don't really change my soils out much. I believe in, in mulch everywhere. I mulch in my garden heavily. I mulch my containers. It actually helps. You know, I'm in Southern California and really, we're still in the hundreds here. So that mulching really does help keep the roots a little bit cooler. It helps with evaporation so that, that the moisture level stays in the container. But I do really recommend feeding. I mean, plants, especially if you're using anything that's gonna bloom, they need additional fertilizer. They'll use up what's in the soil pretty quickly. So I tend to use my soil forever. I just maybe add some top dressing to it every year and I do mulch heavily and I do use a nice fertilizer. I, I tend to use our uh, liquid organic fertilizers. So one of the things I, um... One of the things I do, and sometimes, you know, I know this is a question I often get asked is, well, what about the transition from summer to fall? How do we do that? Do we dump out all our containers and build everything from, from scratch? You know, can we phase plants in and out? Um, what do you guys do? I like to take the, you know, one or two out that are looking tired and then uh, you know, ease into the fall color palette. What, what, do, what Georgia, what do you do with yours? Um, yeah, so I just like to swap out, you know, there's always something I really love to have a focal point that's either an evergreen or something that's going to take me through a lot of different seasons. So I keep that as my base and then I'll just take out, you know, some of my uh, short lived annuals or maybe some of my summer plants that are looking a little bit tired. And what I'll do is I'll just swap them. I really like foliage. So I'll put in a lovely dramatic hookra or an aster or something that's going to transition me really nicely to fall. Um, you can also cover up bare spots um, with, you know, like your, your gourd or your pumpkin or something yes. like that too. But I always like to put in nice, fresh fall foliage. It's really what I like to do. Yeah, that small pumpkin is a lifesaver sometime or some little accessory. And you maybe you can't, you, you've gone to the garden center and you've, you thought you picked enough plants, but uh, I took a few out that were looking tired. And now there's just this hole. That's the place where you can put a fall accessory, you know, that you could, you can have something trailing out the side, something unexpected, even, um, you know, ribbons and, and things like that, that are just not, not alive, you know, and, and they're just, dressing um, to kind of hide those little bare spots. And it still, it still makes an impact um, and it could bring in some, some color or texture as well. So let's talk color. What does everybody like to plant in the fall? Um, I am still a, I, I still love to match my house. Like I still want to feel that kind of curb appeal that, that shows off my house the best. 
Um, so I like a traditional look of the yellows and the oranges, but I have been really enjoying some of the, the trends that I'm seeing of different colors. And I, I'm honestly, I'm on the Midwest girl. I enjoy the color changing of the season. So I want to match, but I get kind of jealous of the folks who still have that greenery throughout the whole year and they can use silvers and purples and pinks. And um, those are pretty cool as, for sure. So Janet, you're in Southern California, so you're not going to get like leaves changing the way that we will up here. How do you color for fall? Well, we tend to go back to what Georgia was saying. We use a lot of foliage plants. So the Nandinas right now are coloring up really nicely. The obsessions and the flirts and things, they get a nice fall and in, into, you know, into winter color. So they're turning bright reds and oranges right now. And I also believe in, I do the same thing where I have a, a standard shrub planting that I augment with some fall color. So right now in the garden centers, believe it or not, we're already starting to see pansies. Uh, and we're starting to see the violas and they can do okay as long as they're not in the, in the hot baking sun. So we can start augmenting with a few of the color items to add a little bit of that fall feel to it. Because we really do have to create our, our feeling of fall here when we don't have those. And we have a few trees that, that turn color, but not many. Georgia, where are you? Where do you live? I'm in Oregon. So I'm okay. just a little south of Portland. So zone eight, maybe zone seven. Um, so we get a good deal. We're kind of, I'm in a really nice spot because we get the color changes, but we don't get too cold. So for me, um, you know, dark foliage, high contrast, things like that. And then also adding in trees, shrubs that have nice fall color. I can kind of get the best of, of both worlds, which is really nice because I'm from originally the Midwest, Katie. So I definitely can, can enjoy where I'm at now. Yeah. And then there's the, there's the holidays. So you're, you're decorating for not just a change in season, a swap out of tired plants with fresh color, but you've got Halloween, you've got um, uh, November, where is you've got Thanksgivings and, and all kinds of things. Um, I love the school colors, you know, so all the kids go back to school, um, whether that's college, grade school, everybody's got a school color, you know, and then you have children walking again in the neighborhood to school with their backpacks. Wouldn't it be cool if you had like the local team, team colors as well? And it just kind of fosters a lot of that back to school uh, feeling as well. And that could be all over the board. And especially with a lot of the darker foliage blacks and, and like uh, ornamental peppers with the black um, fruiting, that's a good contrast at this time of year. And then also could also, you know, you'd swap out a few accessories next month and it's spooky, you know, so you've got uh, a lot of um, different ways to kind of change the emotion of your container for three months until in my area, the, the frost takes it all away. I'm glad you brought that up, Katie, about um, colors, team colors, school colors. We did a blog post on it, I think about four years ago, and it was amazing how popular that blog post was. And, you know, we were just suggesting, hey, use this for reds, use this for whites, and people were sharing it all over the board. So I think you struck a chord there with school colors or team colors. Yep. Yep. And then you, then you start to notice, Hey, wait, that neighbor has, you know, in Chicago, if they're putting yellow and green out, they're my enemy because I'm a bears fan and it's all Navy blue and, and, and uh, orange for us. So then you start to, to see a little competition in a different way. It's all friendly competition. Friendly no doubt competition. about that. Yeah. Gardeners are friendly. We're friendly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so you kind of addressed this about reusing summer plants. Um, does anybody have any cautions there? I mean, to me, when I look at my plants, it's like, oh, that one still looks healthy. I'm going to leave it in there. Um, any cautions on that or any parameters for which ones to leave in, which ones not to leave in? I will say on, on petunias or on plants where you end up with a lot of root mass, I, I take out the root mass and replace that soil um, because there's, you know, not a lot of, you know, nutrition left left there for the new plant. So I, I personally would recommend doing that. I mean, you only want to leave something that's reason, in reasonably good condition behind. Janet, as our soil expert, might have an opinion on that. Well, I think when you're pulling out annuals, that root mass is going to come out with it because they're typically, they don't, you know, that, that's something that you can just pull out. And if you're using a nice soil, it's not going to, um, that whatever's in the root mass will come out pretty easily. And they'll give you a spot to replant something else fresh in and then add a little bit of soil with that if there's a hole. 
Yeah. And anything that's suffered from a disease, you definitely, this is the time to get rid of that. And don't even compost that. Like that's the one you bag up while you're raking leaves and you get that away from your garden. So it doesn't spread into soil next year. It's a good time of year to just evaluate, you know, um, you, you're kind of out of your gardening mode and into more of your, your kind of decor, you know, I'm, I'm painting a picture with my plants as opposed to like maintaining things. You, you know, that this is a short lived season, um, and you don't want to do too much besides a bit of watering, um, or, uh, you know, swapping out a few, um, accessories. So you, you shouldn't have to cut back a lot of things. You're not going to see a lot of like advanced growth at this stage because of the, the temperatures, you know, you normally plants, especially anything with a flower is going to require a certain light level. It's going to require a certain temperature. So you're, you're, you, you can't cross your fingers and hope this plant is going to take off again, just because you cut it back. The light levels, you know, you start to drop and you're just not going to see the bloom season that you did in the summertime. So it's, it's time to just kind of let things go and it's okay. It's okay because you're going to put something fresh and new. So one of the questions we have is how do you know which plants, which annuals, perennials that you might have in your summer containers, how do you know which ones have a large root mass? Is there kind of a short list that anybody can name off or is it a matter of well, when you dig in <laughs> and it's more of a tug to pull out, that probably has a large root mass. What, what's the expert's uh, advice there? Well, I think a lot of it depends on how long that plant has been in the pot. Uh, a really, really rough measurement is, is to, to look at the size of the plant and you know that the root mass is going to be at least equal to the size of the plant that you're pulling out. But if you've been pruning that back, that's not going to be true. You're going to have a larger root mass on that. So you really can't tell for sure until you get, get in there. It, it's just, each plant has its own type of root system, like you know, an azalea or loropetalum. They're really shallow rooted. They don't really have a, a very firm root mass, but something you know, like, I like, like a lantana or, or something more vigorous growing like that can have a pretty, pretty active root system. Um, what we find is a lot of the plants that are lower water and handle periods of drought better tend to have larger root systems. That's one of the coping mechanisms that the plant has for surviving. So those types of plants can be a little bit more challenging to get out. But if you, you can actually, even if you can't get the roots out, you can just cut them down as, as far as you can. You can just cut, you know, cut, a, cut a little bit of hole out and pull out what you can and leave the rest in there. Um, if you're put, putting in new plants with new soil, they'll grow through that and they can actually um, compost through that if you, if you have some, in a large, again, if you have a large enough container, you have more wiggle room with a bigger container than you do with something small. So I still, to, oh, go ahead. I saw some, one of the questions that popped up was um, plant choices other than the usual ones. So perhaps we can all pick our sort of favorite plant that we like to use in the fall and share with the, share with the viewers. I, I personally like to use, um, Dianthus barbatus, something like that, because it gives you still the really strong color and yet yeah, it's still a very forgiving plant in the cool season. So um, something like that I like to use and ornamental peppers. I really like to use those in the fall. They're very forgiving. Yeah, the um, ornamental peppers um, have come in so many colors now too. And then they, the foliage might have uh, variegations and they come in, in all different textures and the fruit sizes could be, you know, sphere shaped or conical. And, and it, it really kind of brings uh, a lot of good texture to the gardens. I, I mean, let's, let's anything but mums, because obviously mums are the standard, you know, you're going to go and you're going to grab a pumpkin and a mom and a kale. Uh, but I like sunflowers too, because it's a, it's a natural time of year for them to kind of look really great. A lot of, you've seen a lot of great new genetics where you get quite a few, not just single stalk, but like kind of bunchy sunflowers. Um, and then the kind of like helianthus, the heliopsis family, um, you know, you're waiting so long and then like August hits and they all start blooming. And as you're driving, you can see the next season. I'm a big fan of yellow. So to have that there, and then I letting the, the seed heads kind of stay seedy and then I can enjoy all the birds that come and visit so like that or anything that brings in a, a, a lovely bird like ornamental millets um like those cattail type of plants I I like those a lot and uh, like Georgia you said there's, there's some sort of thriller in the center that you can build around those are key for me mm -hmm. yeah Gallardi has kind of hit that for us too because they can take extreme heat and for us you know the, the good perennial Gallardias like the the sunset series they go through 
they bloom about nine months out of the year. So you can take that plant out of your container if you want it after fall's done and you want to have a Christmas container, you can take those plants and actually put them in the landscape in your garden and then they'll bloom for you all, all spring and fall the following year. So a lot of these perennials that you're talking about too, like the, you know, uh, are great to put in the container for a few months. And then when you want something fresh, you can just actually move those into your garden. And that way you can uh, extend the, the period that you will enjoy that plant. And those come in all the wonderful fall colors, lots of different yeah. sizes and flutes and by colors and on this. Yeah. Yeah. Just to echo what Katie mentioned about sort of unexpected fall plants. That's what I really go for. And I think we're seeing that more and more people are going for something a little more unique. They are like, okay, the mum's great. The kale's great, but what else can I do? And like those sunflowers, you're right. The ones that are going to bloom on short days and for longer, uh, Monrovia has a sun believable brown eyed girl sunflower that'll bloom up until the first hard frost. So that's a huge time period for a sunflower to really be showing off. Um, I also love, you know, it has a beautiful brown eye that deepens as the temperatures cool. So you get those beautiful fall colors on a sunflower, which I just think is amazing. Um, I also really love large billowy grasses. So those can really transition well from fall. And then they, if you let them hang on, they are beautiful accents through winter too. So something like a panacetum, like a ginger love, which is a brand new one that came out um, absolutely stunning in all of my containers last year. And they're still going strong this year too. Yeah, the grasses, I think we'll see a photo pretty soon. There's one called Black Stockings that has that really dark black, like elegant, but moody um, that you could plop any color around it um, that would make it look great. And, and, and with the grasses, they just kind of, they stabilize that plant. Now, Claire, there's, there's the trailers too, like cool wave pansies, which are when you're talking about, you know, you're not going to see a lot of growth at this time of year, the, the spreading trailing pansies are really going to kind of go against the grain and you will see that fill in. And then if you're far South, that's your winter color. So then you don't have to worry that that'll take, you know, a good, strong, vigorous cool wave pansy will take frost, they'll take cold temperatures. And even if you lose a few blooms, as soon as the temperature starts to stabilize and warm up a bit, that's your first pop of color in the spring. And hey, you just saved six weeks on having to run to the garden center because you've already got uh, color uh, in your in the ground or in a, a really big container. Yeah, and that that they're pretty handy when you're trying to think about what colors you want in your garden too, because there's there's a, quite a lot of different choice and quite a I think the colors generally tra transition very well from fall through the winter into spring. In spring, and you yep. can, yeah, add to them. So thank you everybody who mentioned sunflowers because this is the year of the sunflower. So yay yay, uh, we still can enjoy those beautiful flowers throughout the fall. Um, so there was a question also on guidance on mixing plants with different cultural requirements, like any tips on the drier, wetter sun or shade. Um, I'm, I'm assuming it's a little bit less important. Fall might be a shorter season than summer. Um, but again, I'm not the expert. So I'll turn that over to you guys to talk about um, mixing different plant types for fall combination containers? Well, I really think that fall, especially if you're doing a fall container that you are not planning to have long-term, fall is a great time to experiment. You know, the sun is less um, intense in the fall, generally, unless you're in the Southern California, like Janet, maybe. Um, but if you're in the Midwest or the Pacific Northwest or somewhere where the sun is less intense, you're able to sort of skirt the line a little bit more um, between sun and shade plants. Um, obviously, that's within reason. But you can, you know, if you get really intense heat in the summer and a hookra is going to burn, it may not burn um, in the fall. So you can kind of skirt that. And also, um, plants, because they're not actively growing as much in the fall, they use less water. So then again, you can sort of um, play around with your requirements a little bit more than you could in the spring or the summer. And I would say if you have a, a concern of that, this is the time where you group, 
your containers together in a setting. So maybe there's one large one where they're all treated the same, but two smaller that require maybe a lot less water or a little bit more water. And they can cohabitate in, an, in a display without having to share the same soil volume. Um, and so if you need to move one over, you, you notice that that plant is burning, you just move her a little bit back or you know, put her in the shade of that larger container to kind of give her a relief. So that, that's a neat little vignette opportunity for fall that you, would, you wouldn't necessarily have the chance in summer because intense light, um, different, you know, longer lights and, and extreme temperatures for sure. Yeah, I'm a big fan of groupings for that very reason, because you can mix and match a little bit more than you could in the garden. Um, the other thing that I would say is that, you know, full sun is not full sun everywhere. And there's different, it's, it's a little bit, can be diff a little bit difficult, but a lot of plants that we say are full sun only actually need about five or six hours of sun. So if, if you have a spot that has maybe more morning sun or evening sun, and, and they're not in the, in the full baking afternoon sun, you can mix a lot more plants together in that environment. So try to find a situation where you can put your containers somewhere where they're not getting that afternoon baking sun and you can really expand what you can grow successfully in those environments. One of the things um, that I was thinking about that I, I thought maybe we should make a point of, um, you know, when I'm doing my combination planters in May and, you know, I put them out by mid to late May, I know that they're going to grow in, they're going to fill out. But when you're planting for fall, isn't there a little bit of a different rule of thumb when you're putting a combination together for fall? Yeah, Claire, you like to shove a lot of plants into a smaller container or a, a container to. Yeah, in the fall, I like my containers to look ready right away. So I only use uh, 24 inch containers and larger. I'm, I, I was talking to Katie about this this morning. I'm a plant abuser. I'm not very good at remembering to water or remembering to feed. So the larger soil volume really helps me out to, you know, to, you know, keep the plants going. So I tend to use la larger plant inputs um, in my large containers and I've all got my instant sort of full garden ready to go. So a couple of questions uh, popped up here. Um, somebody in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, I'm trying to plant more native plants. So what do you recommend there when it comes to containers and native plants? <laughs> Ross, well, Ross well, yeah, and natives are so, so native. I, I, can tell you, I can talk about native plants for California, but not for Pennsylvania, other than to look at, you know, what, um, there are some great native, you know, every state has a fabulous native plant association on a website that, that, that will have a listing that are local to you, because that's really the key is to make sure that, you know, even in California, we have 8,500 native plants, but most of them are in high rainfall areas. So we, we only have about 200 native plants to Palm Springs. Uh, yeah. So it's a really hyper local situation on that. Um, Claire, maybe you have more insight being a little bit more, a little closer to Pennsylvania. Or not. I mean, a native plant sort of fairly close to our area is, you know, we see a lot of echinacea in the Midwest. Yeah. Um, I don't know how far that translates to Pennsylvania. And I think it really, you know, I think you're Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, so I, I agree with Janet. If, if you want truly native, I mean, you've got to look at what's indigenous to your region. So somebody um, has a question about a black tulip magnolia tree is in a container, seems to prefer shade and is now blooming. So surprised to see blooms on it this time of year. Anybody about uh, black tulip magnolia trees? Well, you know, a lot of these deciduous plants and shrubs that are spring blooming are having a little bit of a freak out. I and mean, we see this in, in California too with philadelphus and even quince and, and, and items that typically just bloom in the, in the spring are having they're being triggered to bloom. So they're either under some sort of stress, whether it's drought stress or heat stress, they're going into a dormancy period and then they're coming out of it. So we're seeing a lot of that lately. I mean, it's becoming more prevalent as these 
uh, different climate that we're getting now in the summertime uh, are, are hitting us because the, the, that is triggered by a dormancy and then a, a temperature. So if you're having a drop in temperature and then it comes back up again, that plant thinks it's in the springtime and it wants to bloom. Um, so that's what I, that's my guess of what's happening because we are seeing that with a lot of different genera right now. And containers also are really susceptible to those, as Janet mentioned, those, those changes in temperature because it doesn't have the insulation of being in the ground with all the soil. So the roots are closer to the air temperature, which means it's more likely to suffer or uh, bloom because of these changes in temperatures. The good news is though, I've not seen a plant die from that. They usually just keep going. So you, you should be fine. Excellent. Okay. I had promised that about halfway through, we were going to go to some of these combos. So I think what we'll do <clears throat> is we'll let each one of our panelists talk through the combos that I will show on the screen. And then we'll circle back. I know somebody has asked about edibles, fall edibles in containers, and I definitely want to get to that. So let's go to these and Claire and Katie, I think you're first up here. If you guys want to start talking about some of your combos. Claire, you're, you're muted. There oh my you go. Green moved. Sorry about that. Yeah, so I was just saying, Janet mentioned Galadia and here, you know, first up, we've got here Galadia. I really like these, um, these bicolors that really showcase the true four color. Uh, they're, you know, you've got that very large showy flower, a grass in the background there. Um, this one is called Scirocco. It has a green and yellow and orange tint, bronzy tinged um, foliage. And then we've paired it with something, a, a Lobelia, which is a speciosa type, um, really likes the, uh, likes the sort of long day. So it's a great time to, to grow these. And I think this is an example of how you can put a full container together and it doesn't contain a mum. So that's the first one and it's called Tuscan Sun, but a very easy way to combine color. Here's a more traditional container, um, very large container, kale and mum. And then I think somebody else mentioned accenting with things like marigolds, accenting with things like penicetum um, and even canna in there. And uh, typically the cannas are, are pretty water hungry, but uh, in this case, you know, as we get into fall, the, the watering is much more forgiving. And you have an edible, you have bright light Swiss yeah, charge, Swiss which charge, is an AS yeah. winner. So I yeah. have to mention that one. So that's great stuck in there and add some extra color. And I'm back. So apologies, uh, got kicked off. <laughs> no problem. Um, Sorry about that. You, okay. you can take over the next combo then. We've got uh, combo number two. Well, this one has that black stockings that I had mentioned, um, and you can just see how dramatic it plays off of the other colors. Um, and then you've got the um, obviously the the kind of star is the mum, but a very large container that can really pack in so many plants. And our our gardens our gardens and grounds team here at Ball Horticultural this was this was um, our fall color for our guests when they when they walk into the buildings or they they're, they're seeing our gardens here our display gardens so it's it's instant impact you know we're maintaining this for maybe two months a uh, six weeks so covering the soil with just about every inch of plants maintains that keeps that moisture um pretty uh pretty managed um, so you don't have to go in and constantly water these and you can see great soil volume so if you give it a good deep soak those grasses um, and, and everything are going to dig deep down into the roots, but that black tall stockings um, and then the fiery uh, ornamental peppers um, to chili chili is is just just so sweet how it pairs really against the fire of the violas as well as the greenery and purple of the kale and the, and the trailing um, sedum. So you've got um, just like a, a really moody kind of fall classic fall uh, mix here. But then don't be afraid to kind of stick it all in there and 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 cover that soil volume. And you know, if if I was missing a few elements, that's where I might stick a pumpkin or something like that. But uh, the team just kind of said, let's put more flowers. I really like this one. I really I really think it's got a lot of visual interest because there's so many different types of types of flowers and plants in here and textures. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this one perennials for fall. 
I'll, I'll cover this one and then Claire, you can definitely cover the seed side. Um, so this was a display sharing with our industry, a um, little peek behind the curtain here. This is telling uh, greenhouses that these are the type of plants that you could time to have fresh perennial color in the fall. So that when you guys, uh, the gardeners, go to the store, you want to see something fresh. You, you don't want to shop on the discount perennial rack and just see something that's been tired all season. This would be, let's drive new color into the store, fresh purple salvia. Uh, there's both a nemorosa and a greggii here. You can see all the hookra, the coral bells towards the bottom. They've got that kind of um, you know juicy fall colors as well from a black to the purples and the um, watermelon type colors. And then towards the top, you've got Coreopsis, you know, uh, with the yellows and the bi colors. So by telling the, the industry that you could time these plants, you know, to plant and grow fresh color so that when you ship it to the stores, you guys have something colorful to choose and the good impact right away. This was a great display to kind of remind our industry that, you know, perennials for fall doesn't just have to be leftovers cut back, you know, kind of shaved to the ground. Excellent tip. Okay. And then we've got this one, some more perennials. Uh, Claire, you had mentioned a dianthus. So here's- Yes, yeah, this is one, one of, of my favorites. And Janet, you talked about grouping and this is something I like to do as well. So I'll put a single variety in a container and then group the containers. And then you get a chance to, like you say, move one around if one needs turning, one needs a bit more sun, or if you lose one and then you can put something else in. This is a very easy way to create quite a sophisticated looking display out of single, you know, mono containers. Okay, so wait a minute, you're the expert. So you guys sometimes lose plants too? Oh gosh, we kill so many plants. <laughs> Good. I, I just wanted I that people, to be on the record. It happens. I, I kill more plants than anyone. I, 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 I could be a hundred people. I, I I collectively have killed more plants than all of you in my lifetime. Right. Yep. We forget yep. to water. You know, Claire, you're a plant abuser. You know, you yeah. stress it out. Um, we, you That's definitely trial by fire in a lot of our gardens. You know, Absolutely. Exactly yes, I agree. Um, here's another combination. So, yeah, this is what Katie was talking about, uh, additional fall colour that will work alongside your mums. I mean, mums really are a great garden staple, but there's so many more things that you can add to add the different texture and height. So, again, we've got more here. We've got Coreopsis and we've got the Salvias and we've got the Dianthus and the Grasses. And it's so easy to make a really colourful, sort of attractive looking display for your garden. And then if you are so inclined, these would be the, the hardy perennials in most areas that you could replant. You know, if you, if you can look at perennials in a container and just say that was beautiful for a couple of weeks, I'm on to the next compost bin, there you go. Or if you had a space, you could, you know, I, I have a father who likes to just save every plant that he possibly can. So he would never throw these away. He'd find a spot to plant them or he tried to bring them in. So, but these would be the plants that you could do that too, so that you could plant and enjoy them the following spring with a little bit of cutback or re replant them in a, in a new setting. I do want to point out the, the Copper Prince ornamental millet metallics, like that in the garden at any time of year is such a cool trend and a, and a neat way. So like silvers, coppers, bronzes, those just add a different element of kind of a masculine kind of feel a bit, um, but it could be a, an edgy way to dress up your garden with metallics. And, and I, I think Copper Prince is one that, that really does that well. Excellent. Okay. I think you had already mentioned ornamental peppers. Yep. This one is part of our um, plug and play collection. So they're ready-made mixes. So you would find this at store ready to go. So for the gardeners who don't know how to mix a match or like, I don't wanna take a chance. What uh, a lot of the industry is doing is kind of doing that for you or you'll have the retail teams um, putting them together for you. It's okay to buy a grab and go container as well. And just look at the, the color changing of the hot pop. So it goes from orange and it ends up purple. And then you've got pepper blaze, which has three different colors on it from a chartreuse green ripens to orange and then red. So besides the conical versus the sphere texture, you've got a, a, a whole fireball of, of different kinds of colors in this one container. And this is, this is not a massive container. This is like a tabletop 
for your patio if you're still going outside and enjoying your uh your patio with a gas lamp or sitting around the fire pit um and you still want to dress it up you know just changing out a couple tabletop displays could be you can still talk over this one if you're if you're still entertaining al fresco awesome okay uh janet i think it's up for you now all righty well here we go with the nandinas this is nandina obsession and these will color up for you under warmer temperatures. so most nandinas need a cool temperature and they color over the winter these will actually color up during the summer and the fall as well so you get that really vibrant look really you know just your fire engine red and your oranges and your yellows and your fall combinations we've paired that here with some of the hookerellas and just a liza macchia to get that little bit of a draping but you know, feel free again to use the pumpkins, to use things that you can put in there. Um, in Southern California, where we don't have color, you could actually stick some, you can, you know, buy some dried branches of colored leaves, the foliage leaves you can buy, you can put those into, into containers. So, you know, this is something that you can really easily uh, just change throughout the season. You can pull that hookah out later on and put something else in there. The Lizamachia can just get longer and longer and stay in this container. So this is a container that you can actually keep pretty much year round and just tweak it a little bit and, and add and subtract things to keep it going. But I love the unexpected out. teal. You've got a teal pumpkin in that teal container. Yeah. <laughs> and it's still so fabulous? small. Like, yeah. Uh, I love formiums here in the South, in Southern California. Again, we, we have uh, the hot conditions. so. This was a bright orange container that I used for a, a fall. This is Formium Black Adder, which keeps that really dark, almost a black color. And it has a nice naturally weeping habit in, in the garden and in the containers. And I've underplanted that with a little bit of a Carex and a, se a trailing sedum just to have a little bit of contrast to the, and kind of soften the edges of the pot a little bit. But this is something that, you know, you can put this on, on concrete in your, in your container on, or I mean, on your patio. But also I use a lot of containers like this that are a little bit taller with a taller plant to add height in a smaller space. So if you have a small garden space that's pretty flat and you're looking to add some height to it, don't be afraid to put a container in the middle of your garden. You can do this just to get some color into your garden or some height into your garden. It really helps to unify uh, the look of a garden just to have a little bit of a, of a focal point and a little bit of a pop in there. So. These are super easy plants. Again, lower water, so you don't have to water these every day, even in, in hotter climate. And again, succulents. So this is a Senecio skyscraper. We uh, see this in, as a lot of applications. You can actually use them singularly, but they look nice with a little bit of an underplanting. So this is Angelina sedum, but we also, you can put any sedums in here or any of our lower growing sedums um, or echeverias or any, any of your succulents look nice tucked up against this. So these will actually get to be about four or five feet tall. Uh, you can move them into your garage over the, the winter months if you want to protect them. They're not super cold hardy. They can only take down to about 28 degrees. But this is a really nice structural element in the succulent. So you know that these are extremely low water use and you don't have to really worry about if you miss a couple days of watering, uh, you're not going to, to hurt this plant. Or, or So you can really put these out in the full sun, even here in Southern California, and get a lot of uh, really nice, uh, easy, easy care. That's kind of, for me, because again, we know we talked about missing watering and containers. In Southern California, if you miss a day out of your container, it, you, you pretty much have killed most of your blooming plants. So I really focus on a lot of things that I can, I travel, I'm in a hotel right now, uh, that if I'm gone for a week, I know that they'll still be living when I get home. Easy care, that's great. So this is a nice, a little bit more traditional with again, the, the foliage color. We love using the weeping lorocotylums. And this is again, a plant that can go all year round for you in a, in a nice container. And coleus is a very uh, commonly used plant, but again, you're, you know, so many coleuses have these fabulous fall colors. So you can go and mix and match any of your fall colors on the coleus. And then uh, this is a, again, the, the Nandina lemon lime we have in there. You can put any of Nandinas, but this is a little bit more of a chartreuse color. And I'm going to um, fess up and say we have a cordyline listed in there. That is not a cordyline. Cordyline would work nicely in this combination, but that is actually a grass that looks 
like a, I, I'm not even sure which grass that is, but um, it's a lovely fall colored grass, <laughs> but it's not a cordyline. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, one more, I think. Yes, one more. So uh, we're seeing a really big resurgence on agapanthus. And those of us, you know, I, I, I'm actually having to sell plants to our growers and they're like, oh, agapanthus, no, no, because they're the, they're, they're, they're the freeway plant here in California, you can't kill them. But the breeding work on agapanthus now is really phenomenal. And so these are heavy, heavy repeat bloomers. We're seeing three or four complete bloom cycles on these in Southern California. So this is the Ever Series. Uh, there are, they are water-wise blooming perennials. We've partnered that here again with some of the Carex. This is Carex Everillo. And then a, just a nice trailing, trailing pink petunia. But in colder climates, you know, agapanthus, you almost can't kill them. And you can literally just put them in your basement or your garage over winter and then pull them back out again in the springtime um, to overwinter them. They, they can take a lot of abuse. There's a, they store up their energy in their roots. So they're not a bulb, they're not a tuber, but they have a really tuberous root system. And that system can hold all of the energy that the plant needs. So they can overwinter in really you know, dark areas. As long as they're not wet, you can't keep them wet because they'll rot out. You really want them to dry them down kind of like a canna. And then you can move them back um, outside in, in, in the springtime and get uh, your spring bloom off, off of them. Awesome, multi-season there. Okay. Um... Oh, you do have one more. Oh, uh, <laughs> we do. Um, Encore azaleas are blooming now. So they're in the garden centers now. So you can select anything that you would like. We've got some nice red ones and orange ones and different colors. So this is a nice bloom, uh, re-blooming Encore. Uh, there's an Ipomia tucked in there. Ipomias are nice. They're not going to overwinter for you, but they will. They're a nice trailing element in, in containers. Uh, there's a Rubecchias, which are native to the central plains again too. So this is a little bit of a, of a shorter variety that we have tucked back in there. And then the Penicetum rubrum for that grassy look. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Georgia, you're up, but I think you had a, a comment about blueberries. We don't show blueberries, any of these containers, but they are certainly doable, right? Yes, absolutely. So um, yeah, blueberries are great. There was a question about edible plants and containers. Um, blueberries are a really fun, edible, great container plants. There's a lot of blueberries now um, with nice, well-behaved habits that don't go kind of like all over the place. Um, so they're beautiful as a shrub. They create, they make blueberries. And then, um, you know, Bountiful Blue comes up as a Monrovia blueberry that has great fall color too. So they turn bright red, um, really gorgeous container plants um, if you're looking for edibles. Um, but this one right here, so this is what we're calling a fresh fall palette. Um, I really love this uh, mixture because typically what you're seeing in fall palettes are rusts, oranges, reds, yellows, um, but this still feels very fall, but is slightly a different take on the fall palette. So you get this beautiful rosy chartreuse colors here. Um, and it's really all about texture. So you get that big, what I had mentioned before, ginger love kind of sedum fountain grass. Um, does a beautiful job of adding texture, um, more bouncy, fluffy, soft texture. And then we have Euphorbia Ascot Rainbow, which gives a great sculptural element to the container um, and a great color that'll turn more red into the fall. Um, and then next to it is a Hypericum, which is a St. John's wort. This is our floral berry um, rosé. So you get these beautiful yellow flowers in the summer uh, mine is flowering still here um, in the Pacific Northwest. Great pollinator plant. So containers can also be pollinators, <laughs> can also help pollinators. Um, and then in the fall, you get the beautiful berries, um, which are just super fall, super fun, really quite playful. And then moving on to, this is a uh, container featuring calla lily. Um, calla lilies are quite nice. They are super fun and they give you that pop of fall color that you really want. Um, super bright yellows, super bright oranges, reds, really anything. There's even this beautiful black calla lily, which I think is really quite interesting. Um, so here we've paired it with a Carex. This is Ice Dance um, 
Perix, which gives it a little bit more oomph, a little bit more texture, but this would look equally beautiful on its own, just calla lilies. Um, this is also one that can be overwintered indoors. Um, this would also look nice if you're looking for um, color. Sun Believable would look good um, as a replacement for that calla lily. A sunflower here, give you that nice pop of yellow color. Pair it with the grass, it would look beautiful. Um, one of my favorites here is this wonderful container all about foliage. This is um, totally unique, totally different. Um, it is featuring this muccadinia, which is called Crimson Fans. I love its super high gloss foliage. It's sort of a maple leaf shape um, and that deep, beautiful burgundy um, foliage color, just absolutely stunning. And then the subtle... Um, the uh, subtle repetition that you get with the Autumn Brilliance Fern paired with that Northern Exposure Amber, um, really cohesive, really fun with different textures, but really quite simple. There's only three varieties in these in this container, but yet it looks really full. It looks really um, um, quite visually interesting. And then, of course, because I couldn't leave without talking about trees, um, we've been talking a lot about perennials, but um, I just wanted to, to point out that, you know, fall containers, some of the best fall color come from trees and shrubs. And so really don't be afraid to use trees and shrubs in your combos. Um, it doesn't even have to be a combo like this one here is um, autumn moon, full moon maple. It has gorgeous spring color and fall color. Um, and it's a compact tree, so going to be, it's a slower grower, so going to be eight feet tall. Um, so really does well in containers. Remember when you're doing trees, the larger the container, the better. <laughs> you don't want to stick this guy in a tiny container, but it does make a beautiful impact at the front of a home. I just love trees for fall color, especially in containers. It's quite unexpected. That's beautiful. So one of the questions that... Um... It, at least it's on my mind, maybe on a lot of other people's minds, is uh, when you're talking about herbaceous perennials or, or woodies or trees, and if you put them in a fall combination container and you want to transplant them, um, how many weeks or how much time should you allow before, before a first frost, before a hard frost? You know, So if I really want to extend the life of that, how, when, when should I be transplanting it into the ground? It's definitely going to determine when that date is, because again, it's not, it's, you want to be able to dig in the ground and give enough root, enough, enough time for the roots to establish. And if you're in an area where you are going to get a hard frost, so I'm talking Chicagoland and all the Northeast, um, where you know the temperatures could get down to below zero and you are going to get a certain level of, of, of issues, you would, where not, whenever you do that, you would want to, to provide a mulch or a barrier, because that's a baby plant and you're about to stress it out. Um, and uh, you, it's, it's considered dormant in the sense that you, you don't want it to actively grow so much that it uh, starts to flower. And then you, you just, the, the, the plant decides to bloom or think you know, it's in the wrong season. So you, you want to treat that with enough time for sure, depending on where you are, when that hard frost hits. Now, if you're in an area where you're not going to get a hard frost and they're talking about a very hardy perennial, it's up to you. Um, I mean, and, and sometimes at that point, a lot of perennials could survive in a very large container. You might see some success there, just kind of letting it be okay in a larger container and enjoy it next year. But I would think about a forever home when, when you, when you buy the planner, when you're thinking about that, think about where it would be in a forever home and a garden in a bed. Um, so that if you're putting it at the spot of your house that, um, gets too much water, you know, in the winter, that's where all the snow piles up, or you know, it's got a little bit more of a protection, then you're probably going to have more success. But uh, a shallow, rocky soil where you put this baby is, it's, it's really tough because you're kind of your, your transplant shock and timing is going to be important. So Janet, it looks like there's a question for you um, on mulch. It says, what kind of mulch do you suggest? So we'll get your input. And then is it something that that's applicable no matter where in the country you live? I would say yes, because um, you might you might have different types of tree mulches depending on where you live. But really, uh, anything that's a medium size, you know, you, you want to 
about nothing much bigger than that. You don't want it too small because if it's really small, it will actually form a barrier where the water won't be able to penetrate it. And if it's too large, it's just um, really, really chunky and it doesn't help. It, it can actually interfere with, um, as it breaks down, it can, it can take up more uh, nutrients actually breaking down. So I like to use a, a nice medium sized bark. We're here in California, we have really high pH soils. So I usually recommend that we use a fir bark or something that has a, a low pH to help balance the soil as it breaks down. Um, but in a container too, you have a little bit more flexibility with that. With the succulents and things, we even sometimes in the magazine, we, we just do a top mulch with pea gravel or some decorative rock or some stones just to have something that, that will uh, act as a barrier and finish off the, the, the look so you don't have that, the, the raw soil looking. So you can use a lot of different things for mulches, but I really like, a, I really recommend a medium. You know, if you go to the garden center and you see bags of, of mulch, there'll be, the, there'll be a grade of medium mulch and that's what I use. Yeah, and Janet, when you talk about gravel, um, for those of you who might have uh, more critters in your yard than you like, we seem to have a lot of squirrels. I've had good success when I put a decent layer of gravel on my containers, wh whatever season it is, I find that seems to prevent um, the squirrels digging in quite so often. Um, I'm going to go and home and do that. <laughs> because the squirrels are insane pet. right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, I see little holes. They like to take out plants. They like to bury yeah. their nuts. Um, and that's that's helped me, that layer of gravel. So I, I, I'm going to try that and I will report back to you. <laughs> I was glad you brought that up because I saw that question earlier and I was going to circle back to that. And I had heard somebody doing that years ago and I started doing that also. You know, it has to be heavy enough gravel, you know, the, the larger rocks, um, cause I think pea gravel, they probably would just scrape away, but well, I use pea gravel, but I do like a couple of inches. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because I've got these big containers so that, you know, it can kind of take it. Yeah. And if you're talking in the garden, you definitely want to don't, and you don't want to end up with the mulch volcano. You uh -huh. don't want to pile that up around the bark of a fresh tree, or if you're, yeah. you're planting those fall perennials, keep it, keep it even think about it as the soil and you're not, you're not, you know, bulking it up against the, the, the bottom of the, of the tree. Um, the other thing you can use is composted leaf mulch. You know, if you, if you've got a tree that's dropping leaves, you can use a lot of that as a nice layer. There are some butterflies and, and insects that use that leaf litter to lay eggs for next year, you know, beneficial insects. So you can have a little bit more of a balanced, you know, ecologically friendly garden with, and, and that's in the, in the case of just kind of like letting it raking it to a nice layer or a composted layer in that garden. You can still put a little bit of mulch on top of that if you like more of the aesthetic, but uh, but the same thing, just a nice thin layer of that leaf mulch um, can also help with water retention and soil um, decomposition, you know, puts a lot of decaying things over the winter as it frosts and, and freezes and thaws. Um, that adds a lot of good texture to your soil for next spring. Great, great tip there for, for fall. Um, so uh, I cannot believe how fast this hour has gone. It's amazing. Um, I think we answered pretty much everybody's questions. Um, we got through all the questions I had, uh, the list of combinations that we had. And I wanted to let everybody know that um, I'm pretty sure all these combinations are already on our website or they will be soon. Um, along with other seasonal container combinations, we have spring, we have summer, and it's on the NGB website under container ideas. So um, with that, I'm going to thank our panelists. This was wonderful. Like I said, I'm very inspired. I want to go buy everything uh, tonight when I stop at the garden center on the way home. But um, this was really good. I hope everybody uh, is inspired and is going to make the most of your fall containers or other plantings as well. And thank you to everybody. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye, everyone.